In this video, we are going to be talking about the fundamentals of ecology through an ocean lens. So these are the key concepts that we'll be going over um, throughout the video, and you can come back and look at them and pause as needed. So it, within ecosystems, an ecosystem is composed of all of the living and the non-living things in the environment. So the word ecology comes from the Greek word oikos, that means home. And it's made up of the biotic factors, the living things in the environment, like here, the mangrove trees or the whale shark or the human swimming around. Or it's, um, you can look at the abiotic factors, like the currents and the waves and the water temperature. Those would all be abiotic factors. And a habitat specifically is where an organism lives and all of those factors together and how it affects the organism. So scientists like to study how organisms interact with each other, um, not just in the biotic factors and the abiotic factors, but they also look at an organism's behavior. So if you look at this larger fish here, this larger fish has a really big mouth and you can see that it probably um, normally swallows fish and is normally a predator in its environment. Um, that's its niche, like the, the organism's role in the environment is as a predator, that's its niche. And you can also see though in this organism's behavior, in this gif, this fish has stopped moving, is sitting on the rock, is not flapping its fins around. It has its mouth wide open and it's being very submissive. And it's doing that to allow this cleaning wrasse who has a niche of being a cleaner in the community and a parasite remover, it's allowing this wrasse to do its job without threatening to eat the wrasse. Um, so scientists really look at all of these nuanced kind of interactions and behaviors of different organisms with each other. So different organisms like seals or sea lions, all living things will need to maintain a homeostasis where they have a stable internal environment. And so they'll make adjustments either inside or outside to uh, maintain that stable environment. So something like um, a northern elephant seal will go and swim and live in very cold waters for most of the year, but it'll come and birth its young in warmer areas to stay cool. It'll throw sand on itself. It will jump back in the water at times. It might lay in cooler water, all to maintain that homeostasis. So when an organism is living in its optimal range, that means that things are going really well. There's the amount of food it needs, the amount of sunlight, the amount of hidey holes to, to find and take shelter in. And their species can really, really grow um, optimally in that setting. But if you shift just um, a little bit, like say less salty or more salty um, or hotter or colder, the organisms will still be able to grow their population and they're still in the optimal range, but it's not quite as good. But when you step out of that a little bit more, now you're in what's called the stress zone. And the stress zone, you might find the organism living there. You might even find a lot of them, but it doesn't mean they're thriving or growing their populations or being able to, for instance, have babies or grow to their full size and things like that. And then when you go even further outside of that, you have what's called the zone of intolerance where none of them can live at all because it just doesn't have what they need at all. So a species that is living um, in a stress zone is the North Atlantic right whale. And there's only about 368 of these left. You can always look up the newest numbers. I put a link and a citation to NOAA so you could look up more information. But right whales are living in a stressful environment right now. And the females are normally supposed to have a baby about every three years, but they're only having babies about every 10 years. And scientists, um, can only assume what some of their stresses are, but their food sources are really low. They've also been hit a lot by boats and you can see that by scarring and it's different scars every time. So they're getting hit a lot by boats. Um, this is a species that also likes to talk to each other a lot and communicate through sound. And they're not able to do that because of how noisy the oceans are in the areas that they're living in. So all of those things together has caused a decline in the species where they're not birthing um, as often as they need to to keep up with how often they are dying. 
Um, so there's a lot of characteristics of the physical environment that affect where an organism can live. So one of those is like sunlight. Is there, is there um, enough light for photosynthesis for plants to um, grow? Um, what about their vision? Can they see? Are they being desiccated and dried out by the sun? Uh, temperature affects organisms like ectotherms that get that warm up by the sun is it sunny enough for them or is it too hot and then endotherms that rely on body fat to keep them warm um, do they have enough to keep them warm do they have too much and they're hot um, another characteristic of the physical environment that affects where they can live is the salt level so you can have organisms that are in complete harmony with the environment around them. This is like a jellyfish. When it's extra salty outside, it's extra salty inside the jellyfish and they don't care. They can live in harmony with their outside environment. This is called being isotonic. But when you have um, an organism, some organisms, it'll be like really salty outside of their body and they'll actually lose their water to the outside env environment that makes them shrivel. This, a lot of organisms actually face this problem and they have to um, have body plans and systems in place to keep that water from going out. You can also have um, some organisms that don't want a whole lot of um, extra water inside, but the, the outside water will try to push into them. This is called being hypotonic and organisms have to have ways, and we will talk about that in future videos, of dealing with that um, extra, keeping the extra water out when it wants to come in. So there's um, other characteristics of the physical environment that affect organisms. One is like the water pressure. At sea level, we, have, we, um, we feel one atmosphere of pressure from the outside, but every 10 meters you go down below, you feel another one atmosphere for every 10 meters that you go down in the water. And some organisms um, deal with that really well and some do not. And so they can't live in the deepest parts of the ocean. Other characteristics of the environment that affects organisms is their metabolic requirements. What do they need to survive as far as nutrients and oxygen? Are they anaerobic, meaning they can make nutrients without oxygen, or are they aerobic that they need oxygen? Or eutrophication, when they have a lot of nutrients coming into a space and it causes an algae bloom, um, but then suddenly all the nutrients are gone. Um, waste really affect where an organism can live and not just their own physical waste. Think about this little octopi here in its little tide pool. Throughout the day, the water as it evaporates, it's just getting saltier for him. Um, and then also, you know, excreting its own waste and it's having to swim around in that the whole day, but also carbon dioxide. There's less oxygen th throughout the day, not just because the water's heating up, because it, but because it's been used up and there's more carbon dioxide. Those are all things that need to be dealt with by organisms. So this is a video by Deep Antoine, um, how osmosis works that explains that process that I recommend checking out. And then the next one is another video by Detailed Animation on Tonicity from Medical Animations. And it's the it talks about tonicity and the pressure gradient between the two sides. It gives you a little more information on that. So species live in different populations, and that means it's a group of the same species that occupies the same area as each other. So for instance, these tuna in this, in this GIF, there are multiple populations of tuna throughout the ocean. So just the ones living in the same space at the same time is called a population of, of tuna. And researchers like to estimate population sizes and they do this a few different ways. So one is by taking transects where you uh, measure out a specific space and you count how many of those organisms are in that space. And you do that a few different times and then you can multiply that out and reasonably, reasonably guess what the population size is in a certain area. Another method is called mark and recapture. In mark and recapture, what you do is you capture a certain number and mark them and then recapture some later and do an equation to figure that out. So I'll walk you through that. Um, for example, I put up an, a sample here. If you catch like 20 uh, fish, 
one day and you mark all 20 and then you walk away from that and the next week you count or catch 15 and only six of those 15 have marks. They didn't all have marks because you didn't mark all of them the week before. This is the equation that you do. You do 20, which is how many you tagged originally, times 15, which is how many you caught the second time. So the ones you tagged times the ones you caught the second time, and then you divide it by how many had tags. So in this equation, it'd be 20 times 15, and then divided by six. You could estimate that the, this population has about 50 organisms. Now scientists repeat that over and over and over again, and the more you repeat that, the closer you get to the actual population size. This is a video by Jacob Burich, and this is a Palmyra Atoll, the shark mark recapture study donor video that shows how they're doing that with sharks. So populations also have different distribution patterns. So, um, and then we can tell like the abundance, like how many are there. So I wanna show you a couple of those. Some organisms like to all just climb on top of each other and be clumped. They don't care about having their own personal space, they're just clumped together. And I don't think that this is the best drawing of this. They should have little like bivalves or barnacles like all next to each other filled in this for clumped. The next one is called uniform. Uniform is like these organisms, it's almost like they planned out like how many square feet or inches each one of us is going to get and don't come into my little circle it's like planned out then the last one is called a random random is like we don't care we can be clumped together we can be spread apart it really doesn't matter i don't care so i have a couple pictures here i have some penguins and i have some sea cucumbers and i have some barnacles which one do you think shows the clumped method we're all on top of each other so in this one, I have the barnacles on the pier. This is totally clumped. They're on top of each other, don't even care. Okay, uniform, they're almost evenly spaced out, almost as if this organism planned it. The penguins or the sea cucumber? It would be the penguins in this case, where there's a little clumpiness in a couple spots, but they pretty much each have their own space. And the last one that's random would be the sea cucumbers because there's areas where they're on top of each other, but then there's huge areas where they're spread out. They just don't even care. They're just everywhere. Okay, so what distribution method would this be? This one would be the clumped. And then what about here in this picture? Say this Garibaldi, because there's lots of things in this picture. Say this Garibaldi here, as you're swimming around, you notice they each have their own little territory and they're guarding it. What would that be? That would be a uniform um, pattern where they each spread out and have their own territory. Okay, what distribution method is this? Where the stars, we're looking at the stars specifically, um, where they have sometimes a pattern, sometimes no pattern, sometimes we don't care. This would be called random, just random what they're doing. Okay, so populations can change based on how many are born versus how many die, how many immigrate, meaning they move into your population or emigrate, meaning they are moving out of your population. Um, populations can also be affected by something called their survivorship. So there's different types of survivorship. Um, one type is like this type one. Type one survivorship means that when, and I want you to look at the curve of the line. When you are born, your parents took care of you a lot. And it was pretty much guaranteed that you were gonna have a great chance of living until you got to a certain age. And then a lot of them start dying off, okay? That's called type one. A lot of parental care going on and you live to a ripe old age in most cases. Okay, type two is like, hey, we're born and we might live or die equally at any point in our lives we don't know until you reach a certain age and, and nobody lives after that age. And then the last type is type three. This is where a lot of the babies die, but then it kind of slows down later in life and, um, once they get bigger and older, it's it's not quite as dramatic. So we're gonna look, um, birds specifically tend to follow this survivorship curve, 
when a baby is born, it's just equal chance that it could live or die at any given point. So an example of each of these, I want you to think about fish. Fish, do you think they follow a type one with a lot of parental care, a type two where they could live or die at any point, or is it type three where a ton of eggs or baby fish are put out there and a ton die right at the beginning and then once they get big enough, they're probably gonna make it. So fish actually follow type three survivorship curve. What about whales? Whales would actually be a type one in most cases where it's a lot of parental care and then it they'll die off when they're, they're a certain age. The last one is like whale sharks. Now whale sharks, um, they will have their babies and their babies are born pretty big and mostly able to care for themselves. And the moms will actually release a lot of babies um, but that's kind of a type two where they have equal chance of living and dying at any particular time. Um, it's about the same. So other life history patterns are called an R or a K care um, from the parents. So our species are species that care for their young a great deal and raise their young for a long time and their young have a very good chance of surviving. So this polar bear has two cubs you can see here, this mama polar bear, and it's walking around. The, its babies have an R species style where the mother cares a great deal for the young and they, because she only has two and it's only every couple years, they have a very high chance of surviving till they're older. Or a K species is more like this giant clam squirting their sperm or their eggs out into the water. And who knows, maybe, maybe a couple babies will survive. Maybe they'll all get eaten. Who knows? That would be a K species where they just put out lots of eggs or babies and see what happens. Um, so what do you think this seahorse would be? R or K, a ton of, or very few babies, but they're caring for them a lot, or a K, which is just a ton of babies and we'll see how it goes. This would actually be a K species. And this whale here, this would be an R species. And the clownfish, despite what you learned on Finding Nemo, they have a ton of babies and they don't stick with them for very long. So that would actually be a K species. So, Species can grow in different ways. Some species grow exponentially where they take off and they just get really large populations. Some though reach a max that the environment can support called the carrying capacity. So this is called log, um, logarithmic growth and this is called logistic growth, growth. So it can grow one of those two ways. So density, um, there's different factors that affect um, how it will affect um, populations differently depending on how many organisms are there. So you will have density dependent factors that really have a greater effect if there's more of the organism there. And then there's density independent factors where it doesn't matter if the population is big or small, it's gonna just affect the population. It doesn't really care. Um, so a density dependent factor, if you have a bunch of eels like this and they're all close together and one of them gets a disease, it's gonna spread through faster through the population if there's a lot of them all on top of each other. So that's disease is a density dependent factor. Like the more there are in a space, the faster it's gonna be a problem. Another depends, density dependent factor is like food. The more there are, the less food there's gonna be overall. That's a density dependent factor. Um, a density independent factor is something like temperature of the water. The temperature of the water doesn't care if there's a lot of eels or not a lot of eels. It's just going to be the temperature either way. Or say the currents in the space. The currents in the space, like here on this little gif, the currents are going to be moving around one way or the other and it doesn't care if there's a lot of eels in the space or not a lot of eels. It's just going to react the same way. But those two factors, density dependent factors and density independent factors will affect population growth. 
So when you have multiple populations of different species though, that is called a community. So here on this little coral, you can see several types of fish all on this coral and the coral itself is a living thing. So that is a tiny little community where it's groups of species living in the same habitat and the same time. And then each of those organisms is defined by their niche, what they do in the environment. Most of the time, um, species will have their own things that their own role in the environment, but sometimes it does overlap a little bit. So I want to show this picture, which talks about fundamental versus realized a niche. If you have two types of barnacles here, so we have the bigger brown ones and the smaller yellow ones. And these smaller yellow ones, if you look about where they could potentially live on this beach, they can live all the way from deep in the water to very shallow and sometimes even be out of the water. So they have a big fundamental niche. Whereas the brown ones also have a big fundamental niche, but they can't live outside of the water. So both of these, if you took them individually, they would be spread all over this shore, but they're not alone. They actually have to share the niche with each other. So what that means is because these yellow ones are smaller, they can only live up where there's the highest tides out of the water where the bigger brown ones cannot live because they edged them out. So that is called the realized niche um, because in reality, you do have to share the space. And so um, this is called the realized niche of the species. So different com communities will actually compete for food in different ways. They'll either uh, have interspecific different species, meaning different species, they will compete with different species for food, or they'll have intraspecific, meaning they're competing for against their own species. So if you look at these isopods here and they're all eating a dead thing on the bottom of the ocean, a dead body, this isopod that's big here in the middle is competing intraspecifically with these other isopods. So it's competing against its own species for a bite of this food. But it's also having interspecific where it's competing against different species all swimming around here that are also trying to get a bite of the food. And so eventually you have a something called the competitive exclusion principle where um, it's often that one species is kind of edged out or goes extinct in an area. So what that can happen, but a lot of times you also see resource partitioning. And what that means is different organisms are sharing a resource in the same um, space, but each taking a diff, like using it in a different way. So uh, we will have a whole chapter on birds and how each of these birds each are shore species, but they're all fishing for different things at the shore because they all have evolved over time to partition out these resources. So this is a video by the, on the competitive exclusion principle um, by a UVU professor, competitive exclusion principle to check out on that topic. Uh, so uh, with comp communities, you'll also have different predator and prey relationships. And these are very important relationships. Specifically with keystone species, keystone predators, these are predators or species that will ensure the diversity of a population by basically keeping one or more organisms intact. And normally as a big big predator, you would think of something like a shark, but I'm going to have you look at sea otters. Sea otters um, are, now you can't really find them in Southern California, and we have a bit of a problem with that. And we have a problem with that because we have these things called sea urchins, and they're everywhere where this exact purple urchin you can see all over the place in our waters. And these urchins go along the bottoms of our kelp forests and they eat just the bottom of the kelp, which releases the entire kelp and it kills the entire, you know, if you think of kelp like a tree, it kills the entire thing and it floats up to the top. Well, 
where the sea otters still exist in northern california they will actually go down and fish for these urchins and they have a hard callous spot on their chest where they bring the urchins up and even sometimes they'll have a rock and they will go and break open the urchins and eat them and because they keep the urchins in check they have much better kelp forests there and they have a lot more diversity of fish because those kelp forests are still intact so that is a keystone predator that is very important to an area. This is a video by Natural World Facts uh, Deep Sea Keystone Species that I encourage you to check out. This is another video by BBC Earth Predator Prey Interaction Sardine Feeding Frenzy with Sharks, Penguins, and more. And then a video by um, Conrad uh, Maldives um, Rangali Island. This is a whale shark feeding on plankton in the Maldives. That's really cool um, to see. So in communities, they will have different relationships. And a symbiosis simply means that a relationship exists. Okay. So that symbiosis can be positive, neutral, or negative. Okay, so symbiosis simply means there is a relationship, but it doesn't define it. Sometimes that's said wrong where sometimes um, it's taught like symbiosis is positive. It's not necessarily positive. It's just that the relationship is there. So a mutualistic relationship is like the clownfish relying on the anemone. They both get helped and they have this mutualistic relationship. Or commensalism, which is like the shark with the remora, where the shark doesn't really care that the remora is there, but the remora, they get food and things from the shark as it moves along. Or you'll have parasitism, like this cut open eel, where they cut it open and they looked inside and it's full of these um, worms that were feeding on the blood of the eel while it was still alive, that would be like a parasite. So if you look here in this gif with this eel that also has this relationship with the wrasse, um, this is a very brave wrasse going inside this eel's mouth. The um, This is mutualistic in that, let me get back there, this is mutualistic in that the eel is getting what it needs and the and the wrasse is getting food that it needs. So that's awesome. But I want you to also look that there's some parasitism going on here because the eel is asking the wrasse to get off the parasites that are all in its mouth and around its body at this cleaning station. So you can actually see a few different symbiotic relationships just in one gif. Okay. So in the biosphere, you will have different producers. Those are called autotrophs, meaning they make their own food. And these are things that will photosynthesize. This can be seagrass or kelp or phytoplankton that all are using the sun's energy to make food, which is so awesome they can do that. And photosynthesis specifically is taking six carbon dioxide, six water, and it pulls that into the chlorophyll in the plant. And from there, this carbon dioxide and water is turned into sugar and oxygen. And it's an amazing process that is going on um, through photosynthesis all the time. Well, in some areas of the world, the ocean is very, very, very valuable. It is producing a lot of energy rich food and scientists like to measure this. So they measure what's called the primary productivity meaning the rate at which energy rich food molecules are being made out of sunlight and other little nutrients that are there. So you can measure this different ways. Like if we go back to our photosynthesis equation, you can measure how much carbon dioxide is in the water before you start versus um, how much is there afterwards, or you can measure how much oxygen was in the water before you started. So scientists look and measure some of those things. One is called the light dark um, bottle method. And I have a video about that here, um, video by um, Professor Sean Chamberlain, ocean productivity light dark bottle method, where they'll take um, something like algae and put it in a, one goes, one set goes in a dark bottle, one goes in a bottle that has not been painted on the outside dark. And then they will expose them both to sunlight. And obviously the bottle that's been painted dark on the outside doesn't get 
hardly any sun or any sun at all, and the light bottle can still photosynthesize. Well, from there, they can measure how much carbon dioxide was in the water at the beginning versus how much is there at the end because some of it got made into plant material or they can measure like oxygen. And they go over that a little bit more in the video. They can also have radioactive tracers where they put like radioactive carbon in the water and see how much of that is inside the plant after time. Or they can use satellite images to see how much chlorophyll is in the water and then estimate how much uh, sunlight can be captured by the amount of chlorophyll that they see. This is true. So that's um, something to look at further if you want more information. So ecosystems are in the ocean have some basic um, food webs and food chains just like you have learned before. Besides the um, things that are autotrophs and photosynthesize and make energy, you can have heterotrophs that things that feed on other organisms. You can have the first order consumers or primary consumers they are often called secondary or tertiary consumers that eat things bigger off the line. Or you have some things that eat dead and decaying matter like detritivores or decomposers. So in this ecosystem here, you might have a primary producer of this um, seagrass and then maybe the thing that eats it first is the urchin and maybe the urchin is eaten by um, the sea otter and maybe a shark goes and eats the sea otter. Um, but then when the shark dies, it is broken down over time by different bacteria. So you can have that full um, food chain uh, and food web. So you can also have different energy pyramids. So what's interesting is the sun is actually, and we should have the sun drawn up here. The sun is pushing down a ton of energy every day into the ocean. And the plant-like organisms are actually creating more plant-like material out of that sunlight energy. So, um, and from there, you will have different things eat those plant-like organisms. But you'll notice that in this food, this is called an energy pyramid, but I think it looks more like a, a energy like temple, or I've heard it called like a ship. But basically, the organisms that eat the plants, they aren't making nearly as much use of the energy that initially came down from the sun as what they have. So as you go up the line, if they had 100,000 grams of energy on this primary producer um, level, then on the primary consumer level, you have to chop off a zero and you went down from, uh, from 100,000 to only 10,000 units of energy on the next level. So you lost 90% of the energy. And as you go up to who is eating the shrimp to the fish level, you have to chop off a zero again and you're down to 1,000. So again, you lost 90% of your energy and you are down to 1,000 units of energy. And then above that, you could have like a shark that's eating the fish. And so on this level, the shark is the least efficient as far as energy wise, because they are eating so high up the food chain, whereas the plants, they're just making a bunch of energy. Here's another um, artistic rendering of this. If you have something like plankton on the first, um, on the bottom level, and they have 10,000 units of usable energy, and a lot gets lost to heat. I like that on this drawing that it shows a lot of this is just lost. Um, and then you have primary consumers where you have zooplankton, um, little animal plankton that eats the plant plankton, the phytoplankton. Um, and then you go from 10,000 units of energy, chop off a zero to a thousand and then fish. And then the humans are eating the fish. And um, after it's all said and done though, the decomposers eat everything else. Uh, so this is what a trophic level is looked at and how it's measured. On land in the ecosystems, we can also have uh, different cycles that occur called uh, biogeochemical cycles. So this is the hydrologic uh, cycle. That is the cycling of water uh, throughout the ecosystem. And you generally probably know the water cycle where it rains and there's runoff and it goes in the ocean. The water on land tends to be more fresh water, but not always. And then the ocean water tends to have salt 
all of the water in plants and in lakes and in the ocean will evaporate, go back up in the air, and it can cause the whole process to happen again. Here's a video by US Water Systems, the hydrologic cycle uh, animated infographic. And then the next uh, cycle that we can have is the carbon cycle. So carbon is actually amazing because it moves through all the different spheres on the planet and keeps changing form. So in, you can have atmospheric CO2, like carbon dioxide up in the atmosphere, or you can have dissolved CO2 where it dissolves and it kind of acidifies the ocean a bit, or it can get locked up in rocks like limestone, um, or it can be in plant material in the biosphere. So it will basically cycle through all these different spheres as it moves around as part of the carbon cycle and will change forms over and over and over again, which is so cool. This is a uh, video by Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences, Sea Sketches, the Ocean Carbon Cycle, if you wanna check that out. Another biogeochemical cycle is the nitrogen cycle. So on land, there's very few things that can fix nitrogen or pull it out of the air, like bacteria or some lightning strikes or a few different types of plants. But um, this will actually cycle through the um, ecosystem as well as part of the nitrogen cycle. You'll have things like um, fertilizers and things like that that are runoff down through the um, environment in land and the water. So our biosphere, our whole earth overall is made up of many delicate communities and ecosystems. And it's so important to um, really know that in the oceans, there's there's great diversity here in the ecosystem. So you'll have things like estuaries or salt marshes or mangrove swamps or rocky or sandy shores, kelp forests, coral reefs, open oceans, tide pools are here. You'll have all these different ecosystems that make up our total biosphere of the earth. And in the ocean, there's various oceanic zones. So there's a video that helps explain the oceanic zones by Live Science Channel's Ocean Zones Explained. Um, and I wanna show you on here two of the major divisions of the ocean. So one is called the pelagic division and that's from the shoreline here all the way out covering the tops of the oceans all the way across the whole earth, but only as deep as light can go. So it's that top layer of water all the way touching land, but all the way in the open ocean where light can penetrate is called the photic zone that deep, it'll only go as deep as the photic zone. But this is called the pelagic division or the pelagic zone um, where it will, it's only that top part of water. And a lot of things can live there and that's cool. Also super interesting is the benthic division where it's all the water that is in complete and total darkness. There is no light and there's so much diversity there. And we will talk about that in a future video that I think is super interesting. Um, but you'll see that as it comes, there's so much more to explore in our oceans. So that wraps up our um, video on uh, ocean ecosystems. I hope you learned a few new things and go on to the next video.